Welcome to our fourth overview video focusing on guidelines for spans and proportions of common spanning systems. These guidelines are based on structural behavior, structural optimization, and overall economic optimization of the system. They are not absolute. You can violate them, but it would be pretty rare that that would be consistent with good economics or common sense. We will talk about a few situations where you might go outside the range of proportions that are listed here, but for the most part, you should get this riveted in your head. Um, the most common thing that architects have to think about in addition to what are all the structural elements that need to be there to resist all the different kinds of forces is what should the proportions of those elements be. So we're going to have a whole series of guidelines on the spans and proportions of various things. And the ones I'm going to show here in this particular video are going to focus on steel. But when you look through all the videos, you'll see that there's a thorough discussion of wood structures and concrete structures. So we're going to have a, a series of these tables that show span across the top. Uh, for this particular page, the longest span shown is 200 feet. And for the most part, we're going to try and stay consistent. So we'll put a, we'll show a, a few pages where the longest span is 200. And then we'll make a big point of noting the fact when we make a transition to some other page, because we'd like to be able to look at these graphically and have a sense of their relative size. But if we don't keep track of scale, in other words, the span, uh, we won't have a good sense of proportions. So one of the first things listed here is corrugated steel decking. And we've just shown one and a half inch corrugated decking and three inch corrugated decking because those are two of the most common depths that are available. You can get two inch also. Um, and in some rare cases, you might even want to use one inch corrugations. But generally speaking, we're going to focus on the one and a half inch and the three inch as the most common. In this case, we've just shown the maximum length that you can typically typically go with one and a half inch corrugated decking. Um, this will be the thickest uh, sheet material that they make that out of. And typically the length will be 64 times the depth. Um, and so in this case, one and a half inch decking can go about eight feet. 3-inch decking can go 15 or 16 feet. Um, and the span, or the proportions rather, are L over 64. Now, L over 64 for the depth of the decking, where L is the span of the decking, that's a very shallow decking. Um, and none of our other members can be that shallow. And the reason decking can be so shallow is because by its usage, it has to be very wide. And even though we typically want to make a beam deeper and not so wide, we don't have a choice in the case of decking. It has to be wide because it has to cover whatever opening we want to cover. So the depth will be um, at least L over 64 and typically will be more like L over 40 or so. So just to show you what that looks like, this is one and a half inch deep corrugated decking and the roof of a building. Um, this is two inch deep corrugated decking supporting a floor above and a floor below. And you'll notice here the shear pins that we talked about in terms of composite action uh, and also uh, the wire material that's used to reinforce the concrete. Now the difference between this, which is the roof, is the roof is smooth along the sides here because there's no concrete above to engage. But in the case of the floor, we would like this concrete to fully engage the steel decking so that when the whole floor slab goes into bending, the tension is in the steel sheet material on the bottom and the compression is in the concrete. So this sort of embossing pattern makes sure that uh, we have composite action between the decking and the concrete. Now, the way in which we express the spans and proportions for corrugated material is a little different. We didn't show two proportions, uh, a deeper or a shallower, because uh, 
um, the spans that might be involved for any of these particular corrugated depths could be highly variable and the sheet thickness can be highly variable. So rather than show a whole bunch of different uh, uh, proportions, we just showed the deepest and shallowest proportions for either of these, excuse me, the longest and shallowest proportions for either of these kinds of corrugated decking. For something like a wide flange steel beam, which we've talked about already, um, will typically be in the range of a depth of L over 28, and that's drawn in proper proportion right here to L over 18. And again, there will be some exceptional conditions where the beam might be quite a bit deeper than L over 18, but it would be a very rare situation. And when we get to that point, we'll talk about why that would happen in some situations. But overwhelmingly, any beams you're going to design are going to be in proportion from a depth of L over 28, which is the shallowest, to L over 18, which is the deepest. And again, those are shown in proportion here. This is drawn accurately for L over 28 as the depth, and this for the span over 18 as the depth. Uh, typically, the shallow depths are going to be for lightly loaded situations. For more heavily loaded situations, we'll tend to use these deeper beams. So, this shows in one image an example of each of these. This is a joist supporting a floor above. Uh, that joist is fairly lightly loaded by comparison to this girder. And by the way, these are sometimes called filler beams, and these are called primary beams. And we will flip-flop back between those terminologies. But here we have a slightly lighter load, loaded beam, which is shallower. And here's a more heavily loaded beam, which is deeper. But those are in roughly the proportions of the shallow one is L over 28, and the deeper one is closer to L over 18, but even then it's not L over 18 deep quite. Okay, so we also make steel trusses. One configuration is this triangular how truss. It can span typically, and by the way, let me go back for a second. Uh, the deepest wide flanges that we roll are about 40 inches, or in some cases, rare cases, 44 inches deep. Um, they will typically never span more than 80 feet long. We can weld up plates to produce an eye section also, and they can span up to about 200 feet. So to come back to our how truss, it typically will span up to about 100 feet. The limit on that is that these web members start to get too long and too vulnerable to buckling, and then the how geometry really doesn't make sense after that. So we typically don't go much above 100 uh, with a how truss. Uh, here you see a depth of L over 5, so the span is 100 feet, and the depth is L over 5, which is 20 feet. Here we have a deeper proportion of L over 4. There's not much variation in these proportions um, because if you make it too deep, the webs tend to buckle, and if you make it too shallow, it's not structurally very efficient. So L over 4 to L over 5 up to L over 4 in depth is the range of proportions. So this is what a how truss looks like. This is one example of a how truss. Uh, another truss that works really well is called a fink truss. And again, it has the same proportions as a how truss. So here we have L over 5 for the shallowest. Here we have L over 5 for the shallowest. Here, L over 4 for the deepest. Here we have L over 4 for the deepest. The difference is that because of the geometry of the fink truss, it can span twice as far without these uh, compressive web members um, becoming too long. So that web member right there is about the same as one of these up here. So that uh, is the thing that makes the, the fink truss geometry favorable for longer spans as compared to the how truss. And this is an example. This is a little greenhouse on Centennial Campus. This is the National Building Museum, which is an extraordinary architectural example that you should go see whenever, whenever you're in Washington, D.C. Okay, in addition to the how truss and the fink truss, we can use what we call uh, double angle parallel cord trusses. So. Here's the top cord, here's the bottom cord, and they're parallel to each other. Uh, 
uh, a common way of making these is with the top cord and the bottom cord out of back-to-back -back, uh, angles, which we call a double angle construction. The shallowest of these that you ever see is L over 24. Uh, making it any shallower than that doesn't make economic sense and it becomes too rubbery and if it's used on a roof, ponding becomes an issue. Uh, the typical deepest configuration will be an L over 12. That would be fairly uncommon, but there are circumstances where that would make sense. So here we have a parallel cord truss. Here's the bottom cord. Here's the top cord. Uh, they are being supported on girders. So these are the joists, which are supporting the deck up above. And then these truss joists are delivering their load to these beam girders. So that's a wide flange beam girder. And this is not an uncommon situation because um, the trusses uh, become less efficient under very high load or the advantages of them uh, diminish and the simple um, solid web beam becomes an economic alternative. Uh, this is very common, very mundane kind of construction. Uh, the, the steel truss industry pr produces billions of linear feet of this material every year and uh, they warranty it for the span involved and the load conditions and so forth. Uh, and as a consequence, you see this in the roof of uh, essentially every steel frame building that you're likely to encounter. Uh, it can be much more elegant and exciting. This is a bunch of parallel cord trusses, double angle steel trusses in one of the terminal buildings in the Denver International Airport. And what makes this really exciting is not just that it's geometrically much richer, uh, there, are, there are more interesting configurations of the trusses, but also the daylighting uh, it makes the space really lively and enjoyable. We can do steel frames. Here's one configuration, which is uh, thin at the base point, then it becomes thick, then thin and thick and thin again. Um, we tend to use this for buildings that have this kind of rise. Typically, if we have a very shallow building, we use an alternative geometry, but this geometry can be used. And the tables give us uh, a range of rises. So here, if the span is this distance, which by the way is 200 feet in this case, um, under those circumstances, the lowest rise will typically be 200 over 6. Uh, the highest rise will typically be 200 over 2, which is a 100 foot rise. It can go even higher than this. Some churches, for example, that are trying to achieve really lofty spaces for psychological and spiritual reasons might uh, exceed these guidelines, but uh, normal construction would not do that. So this shows uh, an example of that kind of rigid frame structure spanning over a swimming pool. Um, uh, these structures also, by the way, are typically used in uh, warehouses and um, industrial buildings and automobile repair shops and all kinds of places of that sort because these are structurally very um, um, economical and efficient and they also can be manufactured at a very low price. Um, and unfortunately, that's actually damaged the structural form because we tend to associate it with these very mundane applications such as warehouses and automobile repair shops. But it can be quite beautiful. Uh, and here's an example of how it can be. This is an atrium building very close to the Sears Tower in Chicago. And it basically has that uh, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin form, except in this case it's been very elegantly crafted. Uh, all these plates are uh, cut with a welding torch or a laser or a water cutting tool, um, and then all these flanges are welded to it to produce a structural form, which is really very beautiful. Okay, for really uh, long span, shallow 
steel frames. Notice we've changed scale here. We've gone to a thousand at the maximum for the page. Uh, these types of frames can typically go up to about 300 feet and they are thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. Um, 300 feet and their proportions here, the rise is typically no shallower than the, the span over six and no taller than the span over five. And we also have um, guidelines for how deep this cantilever needs to be in terms of how long a cantilever is. So it should be L over 10 to L over 8 typically. And then the simple span in between can be in the range of L over 28 to L over 22. So when we come here, um, this depth right here is about the cantilever over 8. And this beam right here is a little deeper than the span from there to there divided by 28. And again, you see it's thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. Um, if we're willing to truss it, we can go to longer spans. Um, but typically... For this simple configuration, it'll be very similar to that. But when we do this configuration, which has the same sort of thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, similar to this, you see that we're going, instead of 300 feet, we're going more like 450 feet. So the trussing is a allowing us to make things deeper and the deeper proportions are allowing us to span further. But for right now, we're going to look at this simple thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. And an example of that would be this building um, in Seattle, which is part of what was left over after the Seattle World Fair. Okay, so we can do arches. These would be steel arches, and typically they would have a rise of at least the span over four. And this is showing the span over two. Um, but I didn't show that number here. I don't know why that fell off. And there are prescribed thicknesses. This shallow one has higher forces. So the arc uh, depth, the thickness of the arch is going to be the span over 80 or the span over 50. Um, this deeper truss has lower forces, so it can be thinner. So it might be the arc length over 100 or the arc length over 60. Um, so this would be an example of such an arch. This building is spanning from that point to that point. There's one of these arches on each of the facade, and then there are two arches in the core of the building to reduce the span across the building. Um, and this arch has a, a thickness, which is within the guidelines that were just uh, shown. Bow trusses are another common structural form. Again, they are incredibly efficient, um, very inexpensive to manufacture, and um, as a consequence, they tend to get used in warehouses and automobile repair shops also, um, but they can be incredibly beautiful. Um, the depth will typically be from L over 10 up to L over 6. And the span, by the way, can go up to about 700 feet. Now we're talking about some of our longer span structures. So, for example, um, the St. Louis Rams football field uh, has a span of six or 700 feet, and it's basically a bunch of interlaced, mutually bracing bow trusses. So this is what that would look like in a simple structure. Notice the top cord has been run through a roller and curved. Uh, the bottom cord has been kept straight. Um, corrugated decking curves really easily if the corrugations are going in this direction. So it's a beautiful synergism between this particular uh, structural element, the bow truss, and the decking that goes on the top of it. Uh, now we can talk about network domes. And let me show you what a network dome looks like. Uh, this is an example and we'll talk in depth about a lot of the different kinds of geometries, but we're just pulling up one example here. Um, the shallowest would typically be a depth of uh, the span over eight. Uh, 
Uh, the deepest typically would be L over 4, although we will talk about examples that are much more than L over 4. And we'll talk about what special architectural considerations drove them to be that way. But if you're looking for some kind of structural optimum, this is the range that you want to be in. Notice something here. Domes are inherently very resistive to buckling because there's material that is constantly curving and it's self-bracing material. So the thickness of a dome like this can be very shallow compared to the span. So again, this is an external view. This is the uh, desert um, facility or the desert environment at the uh, North Carolina Zoo in Asheboro. And this is an interior view. We have a bunch of these radial elements that are coming up to the center, a bunch of rings that can serve in tension um, and as stabilizing elements. And then, of course, we have all these cross bracing elements to keep these compression members from buckling to the side. So that concludes our fourth overview video, uh, guidelines for spans and proportions of common spanning systems.